Recently, I played Outlast 2, the long-awaited sequel to the surprising sleeper hit of 2013. I went into it knowing little to nothing about the game, and came out with a lot to say. I won't be spoiling how I feel about the game just yet, but I am going to be spoiling pretty much the entirety of the game during this discussion. And overall, I think this video will play a lot better if you're on the up and up when it comes to the plots of these two games. With that, let us take a deep dive into Outlast 2. Or at least as deep a dive as this shallow ass story allows. Oh, tipped my hand! So first off, I'm going to do a rundown of Outlast 2's story from top to bottom and get all the jokes out of the way because there are a lot to make. Oh god, where do I even start? I have like pages on pages. We'll stop and hit some notes that I want to talk about specifically along the way and then at the end we'll have a chat about the plot as a whole. Outlast 2 begins with the player taking control of Blake Langerman, a journalist taking an ominous helicopter ride with his girlfriend Lynn out into the middle of bumfuck nowhere to investigate a spooky missing persons report. The plane, of course, crashes and Blake wakes up amongst the wreckage with no pilot and no Mia. Wait, 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 what is her name? Lynn, 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 Okay, it's Lynn, I got it. I think right now is as good a time as ever to talk about Blake Langerman as a character because he's with us through the whole experience. Miles Upshur, the protagonist of Outlast 1, did not have a voice. Blake Langerman of Outlast 2, does have a voice, which may lead you to wonder what the addition of a verbal protagonist adds to the story. Fuck! Oh shit! Fuck, 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 fuck this! Oh shit, what in... Jesus! God wants me dead? Okay. Fuck. What the fuck? Jesus Christ, you motherfuckers! Fuck you! Nothing at all. Over the course of the game, all we really get to know about this guy is that one, he cares about his girlfriend, two, he regrets a part of his past, and three... Oh shit! Oh fuck! Oh shoot! Oh, oh fuck! Truly, what is the point of adding a speaking protagonist if all he contributes to the narrative is shit that we already know and stuff that we as the players are already saying? We don't need replaceable male white protagonist number 937 to tell us when we need to be scared. The game makes it abundantly clear when you should be properly spooked. So now that we've established Blake, let's get back to the story. Blake, weirdly, wakes up from the plane crash in his boyhood Catholic school. And then he sees a girl he knew as a kid and oh, oh no, look at the blood! Our main man snaps back to reality and gets his bearings, quickly finding that some local go-getters managed to flay all of the skin off of his pilot and mount him on a cross. Which must have taken a while. Was this motherfucker out for like 12 hours? Blake wanders forward and begins to search for Lynn <laughs> before clumsily toppling down hill and losing his glasses. Oh shit, so okay, there's definitely gonna be a section where Blake loses his glasses and is either partially fucking blinded or has to use the camera to be able to see. Oh, oh wait, that never happens. All right, what was the fucking point of this then? Is this uh, an ode to Scooby Doo? Hey, my glasses! I can't see without them! And this, right here, is the beginning of a trend you'll see across the entirety of Outlast 2. Why did Blake lose his glasses for five seconds? The answer is simple, my friends. Because it's scary. Why did that random guy just stroll into that lake? Because it's scary! Why am I suddenly being chased around the bottom of a junior high lap pool? Because it's fucking scary! And what's worse is that the story has a written in because it's scary crutch to lean on. But we'll get to that. Big shocking twist later. Blake begins to make his way into the isolated town of Temple Gate, an absolute shithole packed to the brim with insane assholes who don't initially pay attention to you. Oh, I think that was just bad AI. The player quickly stumbles upon the first big bad that Outlast 2 has to offer. Marta. Why did you say that? No, no, Marta. I said, I said Marta. Marta. Calm that? down, Bruce. Marta, as an antagonist, is just there. This is a big problem that I'm sure I'll be touching on again later, but the big lure of the Outlast games, the crazy roster of nutsos you'll be facing, is really lacking in Outlast 2 compared to the first game. The first Outlast isn't a masterpiece, but I'll be goddamned if I do not remember Dr. Traeger, or the twins, or Chris Walker. The villains of Outlast 1 were absurdly out there and entertaining. You can tell the writer had a lot of fun crafting these weirdos. You must be exhausted. No, let's take a break, huh, buddy? The old two martini lunch? Hmm? I have a little confab. There's a subtle element of humor to the original Outlast that comes through in the absolute ridiculousness of the villains, and it feels very intentional. The villains of Outlast 2, however, are emotionless 
unappealing shells of what they could have been. Marta is just Samara from the ring coming after you genitals with her dick axe. Laird and Nick are just the worst Mad Max villains from the worst Mad Max movie. Val is just a naked transgender man, which I'm not sure what to make of and whether or not I should be offended. And Sullivan Noth, the plumpy padre himself, is in two, count them, two cutscenes. But back to the story, you sneak past Marta and eventually find Lynn. Blake and Lynn sneak out, and Blake realizes two very confusing things. Lynn is suddenly super pregnant, and the whole town is part of a cult that worships at the feet of Sullivan Noth, a man who believes Lynn will bear the Antichrist and will cause the end of the world. And then crazy mud stick people out of nowhere. This cutscene right here is your first exposure to a whole new faction of crazy fucks that you'll be encountering later down the line. The Heretics, led by the Lecherous Val. Just think the monsters from The Descent, but with more parkour and bear dicks. And by the way, where are my dicks? The original Outlast was going DEFCON dick the whole time. That shit was dick central. And that was part of the charm. Very few games have the literal balls to wave genitalia in front of your face at the rate that that first game does. Man, I never thought I'd say this. But this story does not have enough dicks. The first Outlast basically played like an uncut exploitation horror movie from the 70s. Some real weird, I spit on your grave kind of shit. But like a lot of the cheap horror movies from that time, I'm gonna mention it again, the first Outlast had more of a sense of humor about the whole thing, and that made a world of difference. Outlast 2 is so deadly self-serious and up its own fucking butthole just like and then i killed the children in their beds and wept for it was my duty to the great savior above cut that shit out man give me notes to pick up like the ones miles wrote in the first game here let's read one of those real quick i'm already beat all the hell picking broken glass out of my scalp a couple of cracked ribs nearly killed by a deformed giant Looks like somebody tried to fuck start his head with a cheese grater. He throws me through a wall, knocks me unconscious. I wake up in some doughy old man with a face like an alcoholic kitty fiddler in a homemade priest outfit calls me his apostle. Not a job I asked for. <laughs> that was, what the fuck? That was fucking amazing! I will read Miles Upshur's thoughts all goddamn day! What was I even talking about before this? So the heretics, the naked stick guys led by Val, have now kidnapped Lynn because they want to birth the Antichrist as opposed to Noth and his peeps who want to murder the impending dastardly baby. Blake then runs across the father of the woman from the missing persons report earlier. Okay, weird that there's just one normal guy out here? Like, literally just one, living in a fucking cabin. Oh wait, he's dead and his daughter's dead and the supplies totally dropped, I guess we're moving on. The building blocks of the story and the stakes are fully established by this point. There are the heretics, led by Val, and the Noth acolytes, led by Father Love Handles himself. Both groups are in the midst of a weird civil war over a prophesized apocalypse, and pretty much everyone wants Blake dead. When you get down to it, the story of Outlast 2 is essentially a Bunch of schizophrenic people on PCP in the middle of the woods trying to kill each other with sharp sticks. And you are stuck in the middle of that shit. Which honestly sounds like my kind of story, but it doesn't live up to that potential. What follows is about 45 minutes of pretty inconsequential running and screaming and fuck. Oh fuck. Fuck. There's some torture and a bad cutscene, yada 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 yada. And now we arrive at one of my favorite sections of the game, the syphilis camp. <laughs> I remember going to syphilis camp when I was a kid. <laughs> I feel like I enjoyed this part mostly because it really works with the mechanics of the game, i.e. not being able to do anything at all. This segment of the game is mostly dedicated to three set pieces, the crucifixion, the burial, and the boss battle ish with Nick and Laird, the aforementioned Master Blaster knockoff. In between these wacky escapades, you spend most of your time just walking around and absorbing the atmosphere of being surrounded by all of these putrid STD skeletons. Most of them are like 95% dead, so they can't really hurt you, except for one person really intent on stabbing Blake that just walks up to you from time to time, which is a nice and a kind of funny touch. It all contributes to a genuinely effective and impressively oppressive environment. But of course, Blake is quickly captured by Pee Wee and Herman and subjected to a brutal crucifixion, which actually ended up being more comedic than anything. These incompetent fucks just prop Blake up and stroll away. Like he isn't gonna do exactly what he ends up doing 45 seconds later. I'm getting the fuck off this cross, guys! The only lasting effect that this scene has on the game is that Blake puts some fucking bandages on his hands after he gets crucified, which is... Come on, man, the first game kind of fit your fucking fingers off. There's a few more minutes of leisurely pacing down Civilis Lane, and then Blake is captured yet again, this time to be buried alive in a scene that is, again, 
more hilarious than terrifying. It honestly does start to build some genuine tension while you're locked in the coffin. I was getting hyped for a full-on release of my inner Ryan Reynolds, but then Blake just fucking boop, he just pops out that bitch. Look at that. That is... That is goddamn ridiculous. Did this stack of motherfuckers really think I was gonna stay buried under an inch and a half of soil? That... What? What kind of half ass? I'm almost offended that they thought I couldn't get out of this. At this point, Toe Jam and Earl have had more screen time than any other characters in the game, as far as I can tell. So I really wanted to see how the game was gonna kill them off. I was hoping it was gonna be brutal. There's one final encounter with Ferator that ends up being the closest thing this game has to a satisfying boss encounter. And yes, I know Outlast isn't about boss battles, but all I'm asking for is some creative gameplay. And at least this section has like traps that you have to avoid and you're, you're being chased and you're getting shot out with arrows and you're doing shit. Okay? Okay, you're fucking doing shit. You're not just running around getting your ass beat. On the topic of running around and getting your ass beat, I feel like now is as good a time as ever to spotlight the actual gameplay of Outlast 2, the moment to moment stuff. As previously mentioned, most of Outlast 2 consists of avoiding confrontation via running for your life and hiding in barrels and shit. Extra emphasis on the running part this time around though. A lot of Outlast 2 is dedicated to elaborate and lengthy chase sequences, which worked in the first game due to the confined environment of Mount Massive, but they don't really work here. It's much easier easier to manufacture an easily navigable interactive chase sequence in an interior location like Mount Massive, because you can cue the player with very obvious things like cracked doors, hanging ventilation shafts, and specific lighting. It's easy to move through the asylum quickly because there's obviously a finite amount of places to go and those places are for the most part indicated very explicitly. Most of the second game's chases, however, take place outside in linear corridors that are disguised as open wooded areas, so immediately your instincts kick in to just run into the woods, but you can't. You have to run in this exact place in the woods, over this exact fucking tree trunk, and it's just a muddy, confusing visual mess. Eventually, a lot of the chase sequences became pure trial and error for me, simply due to the fact that I kept dying over and over again because I didn't know where precisely the developer wanted me to stand at any given moment. Besides the more frequent chases and outside environments, Outlast 2 also integrates a new mechanic to the game, a long-range mic attached to Blake's camera that you can use to locate enemies from a distance. While it's a cool idea and concept, I played so long without it that I forgot the microphone was a feature for the majority of the game. So, that's not good. I remember one scene in which it's absolutely necessary for you to use the microphone to progress and Oh, honestly, I, I don't know. I thought it was actually a pretty effective little moment. You have to follow Jessica's whispers through a pitch black abyss, and with only sound guiding you through this intimidating darkness, the whole affair becomes pretty creepy for a minute. Ah, jump scare, go fuck yourself! One final thing I want to talk about on the gameplay front is... Well, maybe I played it wrong, maybe I'm mistaken, but I think there are certain sections of the game that require the player to pointlessly run around from room to room like a fucking chicken with its head cut off until some random event triggers and opens the next locked door for you. I noticed this more so in the school sections than anything else, and oh boy, we'll be talking about those soon. But man, if that's really what was happening, that's just... Bad game design, plain and simple. But it doesn't really matter what was actually happening in those segments because me, the player, had no fucking idea what to do and things were not at all indicated to me as to what I was supposed to be fucking doing. So I feel like that's bad game design either way. Now, where were we? Yes, we were talking about the final confrontation betwixt Blake and Nick and Laird and friends. So by this point, I really wanted these two motherfuckers dead. I was eagerly waiting to witness their demise and then... <laughs> All right, what the fuck just happened there? This is the beginning of a trend that extends to every villain in Outlast 2. Their deaths are all just an unfortunate series of coincidences, and boy, are they dissatisfying. Nick and Laird are dragged to their death by their army of syphilis goblins. I guess they're just done taking Master Blaster shit and they decide to tackle him off this random ledge that they all happen to arrive at at this specific moment. If you don't read all the notes you can possibly find, and really, even if you do read the notes, it doesn't feel like a satisfying way to kill off these guys that you've been tormented by for like two hours at this point. And the death scenes honestly just get worse from here. Noth just fucking spits some bullshit out his gullet for 45 seconds before killing himself in his second cutscene. Val literally dies off screen entirely, and Marta... 
We'll get to that one. So what happens next though might actually be my favorite part of the game. No jokes, no joshing. Sure, it begins stupid, like who is this man and why does he walk into because that line? Yeah, staring. yeah, I know. Blake must cross a lake. Oh. Ha <laughs> ha! Little rhyme there. To get to the mines where the heretics are holed up with <laughs> trying to birth the Antichrist and shit. This scene on the lake, unlike the burial or the crucifixion or the death of Nick and Laird, actually takes the time to let you get uncomfortable. It's a drawn out eerie scene that makes you feel truly powerless and alone, and it's pretty good shit. It really sets the tone for the final act of the game, as the naked parkour animals show up halfway through when you begin to approach the mines, jumping across ravines on some King Kong shit. If the Outlast series continues and evolves like I hope it does, I see it focusing more so on elaborate, unexpected set pieces like this boat scene moving forward. Just... Please, less chases. We don't need any more chases. Oh! Oh, got get, get, get up! Get, oh. Ah, shit gets spooky, man, I'm telling you. So the boat scene ends and Blake arrives at the entrance to the mines, home of the heretics. It also starts to rain blood. At this point, you really realize Blake has gone full on bananas. Motherfucker's lost his mind. But let's rewind for a second. Why exactly is this happening? Why is Blake going so crazy? Well, let me introduce this tangent with the fact that the crux of this story the real reason behind everything that is happening in the plot is written in a completely optional note hidden on the bank of a fucking lake 75% of the way through the game. I totally missed that note on my first playthrough and <laughs> nothing made any fucking sense. Let's break down why this twist falls flatter than a Jesus based jump scare. Did you really just try to scare me with Jesus? Not even the real Jesus, like a toy Jesus. God, I bet Jesus would be so mad if he saw this game. First off, as I'm sure you've gathered, I believe that hiding an integral plot element in an obscurely hidden note was a bad idea. That would be like if the whole scene with Wernicke in the first game laying out the wall rider and Billy and the dream machine never happened, and yet everything else still played out normally. I do believe you'd have some fucking questions! And the note itself? doesn't even explain everything. So you're left with even more questions than before you pick that shit up. Real quick though, I'll summarize what the note says. Basically, there are giant radio towers hidden in the mountains around Temple Gate that are being monitored by none other than, drum roll please, the Murkoff Corporation. Ah, who fucking saw that coming? The giant flashes of light that you and the locals have been catching the whole game seem to be these radio towers being activated in some way, sending out a pulse that slowly pushes everyone within its range just a little bit closer to absolute insanity. When I said this game had a crutch to lean on earlier, this is what I meant. In the end, all of the bullshit you see, all of the nonsensical nonsense you endure over the course of the game can pretty much be explained away with, eh, because it's a hallucination. Why does this giant wave crash down on Blake in a lake? Yeah, it's a hallucination. Why do all of the civilist people look like the goddamn elephant man? Yeah, it's a hallucination. Why did that fucking guy walk into that fucking lake? Ah, it's a you fucking get it. Red Barrels doesn't need to provide you with any logical or satisfying answers because they said, ah, it's a hallucination once in a note hidden inside a fucking sleeping bag. Bad. Bad call, guys. Okay, so now you know why it's raining blood. One more time, everybody with me now, because it's fucking scary. So Blake continues the running and screaming that he's become so good at and makes it to the interior of the mine, where he's nearly raped and subsequently chased down by a naked Val and her mud-clad clam. Real quick, I get it. I know these games are about being a complete and total goddamn yellow belly, but I find it really fucking hard to believe that at no point would Blake try to defend himself, especially against a single naked woman wielding a torch. What the fuck are you doing here, Blake? What the fuck is that you're doing with your arms? You're not even gonna try to grab a rock or a sharp stick? You were in a village full of people literally dying of syphilis. You fucking hit him in the head once, and they're gonna drop like a sack of potatoes! So back to the story real quick, Blake properly evades Val, only to be kidnapped again. Just like Daphne from Scooby-Doo. This has got to be another homage to Scooby-Doo. Blake does his thing. Lynn! 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 And is raped by Val amidst a heretic blood orgy before passing out and flashing back to the school one last time. 
We're gonna talk about the school sections first, it's about fucking time, and then we'll jump into the big Jessica reveal. Throughout the game, Blake has been flashing back to his Catholic elementary school, where the player is given clues as to what happened to Jessica, Blake's childhood friend, as well as chased down by the most ham-fisted creature I've ever seen in a video game, whom I have nicknamed the molestation monster. He's made up of a bunch of grabby hands and a scary licky tongue. Oh, he's gonna get you. He's gonna rape you. I've heard a bunch of people praising these school sections as the best parts of the game. And if you believe that, I, I, I don't know what to say. These segments are nothing but padding. This game has more padding than the entirety of the Mount Massive Asylum. The school segments could have been something really special if we'd gone there two, maybe three times, learning something new and surprising every time we arrive. But holy fuck, it's like every 20 minutes it's back to this goddamn boring ass school with the locked doors and the grabby grabby tongue man. I would rather be fisted with a thousand hams than ever go back to that school again. So during this final flashback is when we get the big horrific scene that the game's been building up to the whole time with all of these hours of school shit. And yes, her hair is going to be clipping through her neck the whole time. I had to deal with it, so you have to deal with it. In summary, Jessica, Blake's childhood friend, was sexually abused and murdered by a priest at their school, Father Loudermilch, who framed her death as a suicide. Blake witnessed part of this event, but was frozen stiff and never said anything about it, which led to his weird repression and the hallucinations that he's been having the whole game. So, yeah. Shocking. I'm sorry, but at this point, people know that priests be touching little boys. And girls, for that matter. There have been documentaries and exposés abound on the topic. Spotlight one best fucking picture a few years back. You would have to be a goddamn adult to not infer the twist simply by this horror game being associated with Catholic school, priests, and childhood. Bam, 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 that's a classic pedophilia triple threat right there. This shit is not a twist, and yet Red Barrel spends hours of padding building up to this climactic scene that I'm sure the majority of players piece together themselves less than a third of the way through the game. It's all semantics by that point, but it was always just fucking semantics before, so I guess that's nothing new. What do these hangman notes contribute to the story, truly? This shit, psh. Unforgivable. <laughs> Part of me isn't even sure that this is supposed to be, like, a twist per se, more so a dramatic reveal, but it's just poorly executed on so many levels. Yes, we get to know the specifics of the encounter, but it all just gets more confusing once we see it play out. So did Loudermilch literally start chasing this girl around on some molestation monster shit like 15 seconds after Blake left? And then Blake discovers him and a dying Jessica and... And what? What happened after that? Was Blake molested as well? There's a certain scene, one of the only truly unnerving scenes in the game, might I add, that seems to point to that happening. Lies what you see. Oh, be careful, little ends what you do. It seems like you're playing this scene from Blake's perspective, and the person in the room isn't the molestation monster, it's Loudermilch himself. So am I to believe that this motherfucker accidentally murdered a girl while trying to molest her, was found out by another child, and responded by trying to also chase down and molest that other child? What the fuck kind of game are you making me play here, Red Barrels? But then again, the game never ever makes it explicit that Blake himself was molested, so what was that scene in the bathroom? What was the point of that? I feel like I've said that so many times. What was the fucking point of that? I have so many goddamn questions and no answers to give you. I'm so sorry. Another reason I'm not down with this scene and this whole Jessica arc in general is it's exploitative, but not in an entertaining way like the first game. It's one thing to exploit the murder and torture of fat cat executives and weirdo fake ass Silence of the Lambs prisoners. It's a whole different thing to exploit innocent children for cheap shock value. And yes, they're not real fucking children, I know that, but the concept is there. They're using this concept to make you go, oh, that little girl got raped! And there's nothing behind it. It's just there, and it's blunt and obvious from the get-go and devoid of meaning and stupid. It's just stupid. STUPID! Once you get done with the sequence, you're carted back to the mines, where you have to escape Val with Lynn at- wait, what? Wait, she's dead? Is she dead? She's just fucking dead, okay. Sure, just kill her off screen, that's fine. Blake and Lynn escape the mines, as Lynn begins to go into labor while the apocalypse starts around them. You're chased by Marta one last time, and I just don't know how we're gonna make it out of this one, guys. What are- What the fuck was that? Yeah, 
I get it. The game's about fucking religion. Maybe all of these anticlimactic as fuck deaths are supposed to be like God watching over you and protecting you or something, but actually adding God into a deus ex machina does not make it any better. Disappointment number fucking, I don't know, I lost count. Lynn has the baby in the church from the beginning and dies. Noth shows up and says God won't talk to him anymore and slits his own throat. And Blake walks into the sunset with his imaginary baby after his wife died in imaginary childbirth. Cue a nuclear explosion. Cut to credits. Yeah, I'm not satisfied with that one. Okay, first off, and this is a little thing to me, but why did Noth kill himself? He said God wouldn't talk to him anymore, which implies that the towers have been shut off if he's no longer experiencing the vivid visions given to him by the radio waves. But then we immediately see another flash of light as Blake walks into that shit. The machines aren't off, my man. You should've just waited five fucking seconds. To me, it really feels like this game is missing an ending. And I'm not talking about just one cutscene. I'm talking upwards of like 30 minutes to an hour of gameplay. Now that is purely speculation, and probably not true, but apparently cut content implies that they got rid of an entire death scene for Val, which, <laughs> you know, would have been nice to have, so who knows what the fuck else they cut out. In a perfect world, I feel like this game would end on an even darker note. Blake keeps walking into the wilderness until he can't walk anymore, he falls asleep and wakes up to no baby, he realizes it was fake the whole time and that breaks his mind even further than everything else has. Maybe he gets attacked by fucking wolves, maybe he gets right to the edge of a gas station with real people after like days of walking and then BAM! Everybody in the gas station gets gunned down by Murkoff mercenaries. They drag Blake back to one of the radio towers which could be like a really stark pristine environment totally contrary to everything you've experienced up to this point. And they lay everything out on the table about the radio towers and all that shit before telling him he's a loose end that they can't afford before killing him. Sure, that would be dark as fuck. But really, anything would be a damn sight better than what we got. In the end, what we did get was a convoluted mess. A game that feels like the true definition of everything in the kitchen sink. It feels like the developers just drew a bunch of concept art with a loose theme of zombie redneck torture family and slapped that shit together. Okay, we're gonna crucify Blake and then we're gonna bury him alive and then there's gonna be a, a man but turns out he's got a pussy and then there's gonna be an elementary school and a, and a rape monster and our main character has a traumatized childhood and, and, and was raped or, or something. I, I don't know, I'm crazy. Make up your mind! Just focus on one thing and tell a coherent story. The first game knew what it was. It was a cheesy as fuck, straight to the point horror thriller with a sense of humor and a nice little sci-fi twist at the end. This game is an amalgamation of a bunch of half thought out themes that never feel genuinely elaborated upon. Nothing is said by the end. And I'm not saying something has to be said in a game like this, but it really feels like Outlast 2 was trying to make a point. I just don't know what the hell that point was. Was the whole point of this 10 hour exercise to say that religion is bad? Is that it? You could have just shown me a picture of the fucking crusades and I could have gone home! In conclusion... We have talked at length about a lot of stuff in this video. Outlast 2 had a lot of potential in my eyes. I can see a good game in there, but to me it never fulfilled that potential. I believe there's some interesting ideas at play here, and there's the seed of some horrifying stuff, and I just say nice things. My mom taught me to say nice things. Honestly though, I enjoyed some of my time with Outlast 2, particularly the boat segment and the syphilis camp. I want more of this series, I want to see it grow. So if if you see this game on sale for cheap, I do recommend picking it up, because there is some fun stuff in there. But for the most part, from the clunky gameplay to the self-serious and overly obtuse story to the awkward and padded school levels, this game was a disappointment. I really enjoyed the original game, I've been playing it again since I finished the second one, and that game, that game is worthy of your time. Just go play the first Outlast. <laughs> <laughs>